Book of Worship, the Green Hymn Book, this is the one that we use, and it has little numbers in the front and big numbers in the back. The little numbers in the front is our service. So turn to page 77 in the front, page 77, and we're doing the second setting today. And the way this thing works is that that you do the bold face type and I do the other stuff, okay? On the 77th Sunday after Pentecost, or 17th Sunday after Pentecost, we begin today's service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and meet us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all of you that worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help save, comfort, and defend those gracious Lord. Salutation on page 82. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Turn to your today's readings bulletin insert and join with me in praying the prayer of the day. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and our feelings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us. And guide us to the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Will the congregation please be seated for the reading of today's lessons? It's so good to be back and see everybody again. Great. Uh, the first reading this morning on this 17th Sunday after the cross is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, and 25 through 32. A reading from Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the, God, says the Lord God, this
This proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of, every, of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, we haven't done this in a while. We're going to do the appointed psalm for the day, which is Psalm 25. And what are we going to do? We're going to sing it like they used to do in the monasteries back in the old days. So the plain type is Joe. Are you singing today, Joe? Absolutely. Oh, he's with voice today. <laughs> and the bold face, that's you. And so I want you to sing this. It's easy. It's easy tune to follow along. Follow the lead of Joe. Joe, take it away. Psalm 25, beginning with verse 1.
And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the congregation, please rise and join us in our appointed gospel verse. Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 21, beginning with verse 23. This is a great thing for me. 
Now, meantime, it's hard on Tom because he likes to smoke cigarettes during the drive-in church service, so it's going to kill him here now. So, Tom, if you have to stand over here on the deck and something. My father in Oklahoma thinks that's the greatest thing he's ever heard, that Tom smoked cigarettes during the church service. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad to be back inside again. So let's get to work here on the Gospel of Matthew. We've been working on this all year, you know, Gospel of Matthew. Now we're up to Matthew chapter 21. Stop. What comes before Matthew 21? Matthew chapter 20. Back, 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 back. With Matthew chapter 17, we have the transfiguration story. That is Jesus on the mountaintop, way, way up, about 80 miles north of Jerusalem. And what does, what does the voice of God say? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So from chapter 17, down, 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 he goes downhill from Galilee through Samaria, and now he's in Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem? Yeah. What's he doing in Jerusalem? Ready? He's in Jerusalem for the last time. If you back up, Matthew chapter 21 is loaded, loaded. It starts out with Palm Sunday. Remember Palm Sunday? Jesus starts over here by that cross, that's the Mount of Olives. He crosses into the Kidron Valley. He enters the holy city of Jerusalem, here's the temple. And the chief priests and scribes that we're talking about today are watching this event going on. And what are the people doing? They're waving palm branches and they're shouting, Son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna, pick up a ray for Son of David. That's what they're doing. When does today's story take place? The next day. But wait, there's more. You know what else he did? First, he enters Palm Sunday. Then he enters the court of the Gentiles. That is, here's the temple over here. See this? Please. Invite me to do a temple lecture sometime. <laughs> I could do 24, 30 hours maybe on the temple, right? This is from the National Geographic, the well-known Christian magazine. Do they care about God? No. They care about rocks and, and geography. So this is a great illustration. It shows the second temple right here. Where is that now? You've heard of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem? The third holiest site in Islam, right? That's where the Holy of Holies So this is it right here. The Court of the Gentiles is out here. The temple is a campus, right? Like this is the church, this would be the temple. So the campus would be like the cemeteries and all the land around here. The court of the Gentiles is a place where the people of the nations, the ethnic people, are supposed to come there and worship the one true God. But wait, what happened? When Jesus enters the temple precinct, right? He goes into the court of the Gentiles. What does he see? Money changers. They have their ATM machines set up. They're doing currency conversions there. And who makes money on the currency conversions? The chief priests and the scribes. What does Jesus do? He cleanses the temple. You've turned my house. This temple, what is the temple? The house of God? So Jesus says, you've turned my house into what? A den of thieves. You're crowding out the people of the world so they can't get to God. You're obstructing God. Get out of the way. He cleans house. Well, then what does he do? Then he goes across over here to Bethany and over here. This is all in chapter 21. And he slits, spends the night. He comes back into Jerusalem and he sees a fig tree there. And the fig tree, nothing on it. So he curses the fig tree. Then he walks into the temple. And to Ching, this is today's sermon. Jesus is where? He enters the temple. What temple? The second temple right there, the one that Herod has been building since 20 BC. It's still under construction and it won't be finished till 66 AD. What do you know? You know this, you've been hanging around me long enough. What happened to the second temple? What happened to that temple? The 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legion destroyed Jerusalem and the temple August 10th, 70 AD. What's the death, burial, resurrection of Christ? 33 AD. Within 40 years of this story, that temple is gone. Again, this is like the World Trade Center. Except the World Trade Center is only a financial place. This place is a financial place. It's the temple treasury for the Jewish people. Right? You have to pay a one. Every Jew has to pay one um, a, a shekel a year for your dues. Well, that accumulates. It's like the Fort Knox of the Jews in the ancient world. It's also their religious center. It's like the Vatican. But it's also like the Supreme Court. 
Supreme Court with the Sanhedrin with 70 members plus the high priest, 71. So it's a religious, economic, and political center of the Jewish religion. It's the Axis Mundi, the navel of the universe. And that's where Jesus is. Here he is. So he's in the temple. Now, you know what? This is his last recorded appearance in the temple. Mm. Chapter 21. After this, it's Holy Week, and he's going to be betrayed on Monday, Thursday. He's going to be crucified, buried, and raised again. What's the gospel? The DBR, death, burial, resurrection? That's what we're going to. So this is like Monday of Holy Week. He enters the temple. And what happens to him? He's teaching. How many people are there? You know, if, you're, if you have a bar mitzvah, and that means you could read Hebrew, you are, as a Jewish man, you were entitled to stand up and to comment on the, on, the, on the Torah. So Jesus is from Nazareth. He's down in the temple, and you're allowed to do this. You're allowed to stand up, and you're allowed to teach. Now, we know that his teaching is astonishing. Remember, what did the, te what did the people say? People like this. What is this? This guy, he doesn't teach like the elders. He says things like, you have heard it said for men of old, but I say unto you. Jesus has authority. He teaches. It's not about where did he get the authority from. It's about I am who I am. Jesus doesn't quote experts. He doesn't say Rabbi so-and-so said this, Rabbi so-and-so. No, instead, he speaks from himself. The people are blown away. He teaches like one that has authority, not like the scribes and them. How does this happen? They can't believe it. So when Jesus is in the temple, guess what? It's not just the big 12, the apostles that are there. No, there's disciples. And then there's hangers on. There's like maybe a couple of hundred people standing around him while he's teaching. And they've never heard anything like it. This guy is unbelievable. He's up there teaching. It's been 400 years since there's been a prophet in Israel. And this guy's standing up talking. And they're hanging on every word. They can't believe it. Finally, we thought God turned, turned his back on our nation. But instead, look, God has sent a new prophet. And this guy is dynamic. He's exciting. He's unbelievable to what he's doing. He's talking. He's, he's rocking, the, he's rocking the, the, the whole system here. Well, guess what? The chief priests and the scribes, who are they? The bureaucrats. The deep state people that run the second temple. They're the ones that are offended. What do they do? They walk up to Jesus. Where? Not one-on-one. -on -one. Remember, if you have an issue with somebody, you're supposed to do one-on-one, -on -one, pull them aside. Oh, no. This is a public thing. Remember, they're in the temple. A couple hundred people standing around. Jesus and Jesus. They walk up to him. They push their way up to the front of the crowd, and they ask him a question. Now, stop. You know, there's two kinds of questions. There's a question like, Pastor Mark, I didn't understand what you were ranting about today. Could you explain that to me? No problem at all. That's a good question. We like questions here. We, I always tell you all the time, don't leave your brain outside the door of the church. If you have a question, if I don't know the question, I can look it up. I have a big library up there. Questions are good. That's how you learn. You learn by questions, right? And remember, when someone asks a question, listen to the answer. No problem at all. This is not that kind of question. This is the kind of question where you gotcha. It's like stick the knife in to make them look bad. What do they want to do? They want to humiliate Jesus. Remember, in an honor-shame society, what's the worst thing that can happen in the Oriental world? Lose face. They want to cause Jesus to lose face. Where? In front of all of his supporters. In front of several hundred people. They want to make Jesus look like a donkey. They want to make him, why? Because Satan's tactic is this. Satan wants you to think you're all by yourself. So he peels away your students. He peels away your followers. He peels away your family. He peels away the people from your own town. Remember, he goes to Nazareth and they run him off? Run him off? They want, Satan wants Jesus to be standing all by himself with nobody around. That's the goal here. They want to cause, the, they want to humiliate him. It's not enough to say, Jesus, I disagree with a couple of points, and let me, let's have a rational discussion about this. No, this is a point, this is a question designed to destroy, not to inform. See the difference? Okay, so they say this in front of all those people, right? By what authority do you do these things, and who gave you this authority? 
The word authority appears four times in this little reading here, four times. Two by the scribes and Pharisees, chief priests, and two by Jesus. Two against two, okay? Where do you get this authority? What are they talking about? They want to know this. All right, J-Man, where are you from? You're from Nazareth. What do you do? Your father was a technon, like technology. That means he's a carpenter, stonemason, builder guy. In the ancient world, what is your occupation? I talk to my Adobe college kids all the time. CIA is not bad because they know what they want to do. Most college kids are like, I didn't know what to major in. Major in something you can get a job and pay off your student loans, you moron, right? <laughs> so, so they don't know what to major in. They don't know. They don't know what to major in, right? In the ancient world, the problem is solved. You do what your father did, and your father did what his father did. That's what it, it's the family business. There's no, I don't know what to do with myself, right? So what are you supposed to do? In the ancient Near East, you're supposed to maintain your social station. We don't want, you can't be uppity. So where is Jesus from? Isn't this Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph the carpenter? In other words, get back to Nazareth and start making furniture like you're supposed to do. What, by what authority do you do this? They want to know. What yeshiva did you go to? What rabbi ordained you? Did you go to Harvard or Princeton or Yale? You're not an expert. If you're not an expert, your opinion doesn't count. Only expert opinions count, and we all know that experts have never been known to be wrong. Their models are accurate 100% of the time. You're not allowed to challenge the experts ever, 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 ever. What happens if you challenge an expert? They will kill you because you are undermining their self-esteem. You're undermining their authority. You're undermining their power. Well, guess what? By what authority do you do these things? What gives you the right, Jesus, from Nazareth, a nothing, a nobody, a peasant, an Amorites, and a people of the land? You're standing here in the temple. The Axis Mundi of the Jewish religion, and you are teaching and you're saying things like, you've heard it said from Mount of Old, but I say unto you. What gives you the right to say that? What gives you the right? They're trying to destroy him, aren't they? And who gave you this authority? Stop. Are you familiar with the miracles that Jesus does? During his ministry, we're up to Matthew chapter 21, so you've heard a bunch of them this year. Jesus has authority and victory over what? Over Satan. Victory over disease. Victory over nature. And victory over death. Miracles are signs that point to the to the miracle man, the miracle doer. By what authority? Obviously. It's not coming from Satan, it's coming from God himself. And they've been watching this. Just to make sure you got the point, if you read chapter 21, we'll up a few verses from today's text. What is Jesus doing in the second temple? Well, he's teaching, but you know what else he does? He brings sight to the blind and he makes the lame walk. It says it right there. He's doing miracles right under their big noses. And they resent it. Think how sick and twisted this is. A guy's blind for his entire life. A person is lame, they can't walk, and Jesus heals them, and they're upset about it. What kind of a sick freak would do that? They resent him. They hate him. Because he's challenging the status quo. He's rocking the boat here. You can't do this. By what authority do you do this? What does Jesus do? Here's what Jesus says. Oh, I'm sorry, it must be a misunderstanding. I'll return to Nazareth and keep a low profile. You win, you're experts. You're religious leaders, who am I? Is that what he does? This is ancient Near East Mediterranean culture. It's in your face. When someone does a challenge like this with evil intentions, remember, they're not here to find out information. They don't care what his authority is from. They think they have the authority and they don't want to give it to anyone else. You see what the point is? They resent him. They hate him. Their question is an evil question. So what does Jesus do? He responds in their face because it's Mediterranean culture. None of this gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Shouldn't he have turned the other cheek? 
and went back to Nazareth again? No, because he's in Jerusalem to die on the cross for your sins. That's what he's there to do. So what does he do to these people? He says, I'll tell you what. I'll answer your question by what authority, but first, you have to answer a question for me. Isn't that interesting? Notice, what is he doing? They hit the ball in his court. He, he, he smacks it right back in their face again. And he says, look, you remember John the Baptist, don't you? The late John the Baptist, my cousin, what happened to him? He was beheaded by Herod Antipas. Remember John the Baptist? He's a man who wore camel's clothes with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts of wild honey. He was out in the desert. He was out baptizing people in the Jordan River. Who did he baptize? People that know they have an issue and a problem. I'm not perfect. I can't go to church. That's okay because God forgives you. You were supposed to repent. You're supposed to turn your life around and get back to God. That's what John the Baptist was doing. How popular was John the Baptist? John the Baptist had thousands of followers who went out into the desert to find him baptizing people in the Jordan River, and they said, baptize me. John the Baptist is a prophet who comes from God. John the Baptist and Jesus go together like this. John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. If you got John the Baptist under your belt, guess what? You're going to understand who Jesus is. So who is John the Baptist anyway? Let me ask you a question. Was his baptism, was his mission in life of human origin down here, or was it of divine origin? Now, is that an important thing? Of human origin means he changed his meds, and he's just ranting and raving about down here stuff, right? It's his own, it's his own odd opinion. Therefore, if it's of human origin, do you have to listen to what he says? No, it's just another lunatic, a religious lunatic. So if it's human origin, you're off the hook. But if it's from God, you know what? That's problems. That's a problem. So what do they do? They go like this. They have a conference. Probably one of those Zoom calls, you know? <laughs> they have a, and they, and they, 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 they do game theory. They strategize all the alternatives. Okay, if we say of human origin, we're gonna be in big trouble. Why is that? Because we're standing in front of a couple hundred people. What happens in the ancient world if you offend a couple of hundred people? They'll take you out by the edge of town and stone you to death. It's lynching. That's what they do. In other words, we have to keep the people on our side. Here's a little, here's a little thing about elite people, about these, these temple people, right? They are afraid. Phobia. Phobos, phobia of who? The people. That's why they operate by stealth. They operate in the dark of night. They want to make sure you, common people, don't find out what they're up to. They're in it for the power. They're in it for the money. They don't care about God. They don't care about you. They don't care about people. They care about maintaining their position. Why is that important? These are the people that are going to hand Jesus over to the Romans to be killed. Why is that a big deal? You see... There's an unwritten law in the Near East. You do not hand over a brother to the Gentiles or to the foreign occupiers to be killed or prosecuted. When, they, when the Romans come around, do you see what terrorists did this? We didn't see anything. No, didn't see a thing. In Islam, they do the same thing to this day. That's why it's so difficult. When we're over there trying to get intelligence on you know, terrorists in Islam, we didn't see a thing because you don't betray a brother by handing him over to the outside people. What did they do? They handed Jesus over to the Romans to be killed. You don't do this. This is so stinking offensive. It's odious. It's detestable what these people did. They handed over one of their own people to be killed by the Romans. Right? So they're afraid. They're afraid of the people. Because if we say the wrong thing, then what? They're all going to go over on Jesus' side. They're all going to stand there when Jesus enters the city and wave the palm branches. We can't have that. We need the support of these sheep here, these ignorant people, in order to maintain our power position. It's devastating. Well, if we say John the Baptist is of human origin, then they're going to know that we don't care about John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is very popular with the people. The people know what God is up to. 
Thomas Jefferson, believe it or not, has unlimited faith in the power, the common sense of people. Think about that. People are going to make the right decision. They're afraid of the people. They don't want to hear what the people have to say. They're afraid of them, and they act out of fear. A wounded animal, a bear who's wounded, they act out of fear, and that makes them really dangerous. They're dangerous. So they're, they're afraid of the crowd. But then, if we say he's from God, that's going to give us even more problems. If he's a prophet, because then Jesus is going to say something like, why didn't you listen to him then, if he's from God? You rejected the prophet of God, John the Baptist. You thought it was a good thing that Herod Antipas chopped off his head. In other words, Jesus beat him. This technon, this humble carpenter from Nazareth, this nobody, this low person, beat the power elite people that run the temple in Jerusalem. What does that mean? Jesus has wisdom. Wisdom is a gift from God. He has wisdom that excels quantum leaps above the geniuses that run the temple in Jerusalem. Think about that for a minute. He turned the table on them. They came there to humiliate him. They came to destroy him. They came to strip away all the support. And instead, Jesus beat them. The smartest people in the room, the Harvard, Princeton, Yale people, Jesus beat them. They lost face. Where did they lose face? At the second temple in Jerusalem, their power center. They lost face. Now, some people probably didn't get the point of the story. So this is what Jesus does. He tells you a parable, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. How do you know it's a parable? He says this, what do you think? Why do we like to teach the parables of Jesus? He's a master teacher. And a master teacher sucks you into the story. It makes you a part of the story. This is a story about a dysfunctional family. I can't relate to anything like that. My family's perfect in every way. <laughs> it's all right, it's only a dragonfly. Those, those are great. I cued it to come in halfway through the sermon, so here it is, okay. Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's a dysfunctional, this is like the Jerry Springer show kind of stuff, okay? We can relate to this. So what do you think? So you're sucked into the story immediately. Jesus says, there's a man, and he has two sons. Okay, that's good. I can relate to this. I have three daughters. I've been through all this drama before. Well, how bad could it be? So a man has two sons, and this man, he owns a vineyard. And he goes to his first son and he says, son, go and work in the vineyard today. Stop. Now for us, we would say, well, what's the big whoop de do? You know, it's okay to have sons that will say things like, I'm busy now playing video games, sleeping in the basement. You're 35, it's time to get a job. You can't, can't do that. We're used to this. Why? Because our world is upside down from the Bible world. In the Bible world, if your father says, son, go to the vineyard and work, what is the right answer? Yes, Why? Because in the ancient Near East, they don't have police, they don't have military. They live in like family compounds, family clan tribe. And if the sons are not obedient to the father, guess what? Anarchy breaks out and society breaks down and the family unit's not gonna function. You're not gonna get the grapes in, there won't be any money for the family to function. In other words, it's a life and death issue. In fact, in the Torah, the Torah says, what do you do with a rebellious son? Here's what you do with him. The people in the village will come to your house and take him away and stone him to death outside the city limits. The penalty for rebellion against your father is death. What's the fourth commandment? I don't know, I forgot. Honor your what? Mother and father and all the people in authority over you. In other words, this son, this is a rebellious son question. For us, it's hard for us to relate because we think our children are supposed to be smarter than we are. You ever watch the commercials on TV? I can't stand it. The father is always an idiot and the girl, who is usually about 12, is the smartest person on, on, on there and she's the one who decides what the family's gonna buy, what kind of car they're gonna get or whatever. Our society is flipped upside down. Well, this parable is not so. 
So the father says, go and work in the vineyard. And what does the son say? I will not. In other words, that's a rebellious son. Okay? And wait, what's the penalty? Death. But what does the son do? Later on, he changes his mind and he went. First he says no, then he thinks about it, and then he, he repents and he comes back and then he does his job. Then the father goes to the second son, and what does the second son do? He says, yes, sir. I'm going to go. And then what does he do? He doesn't go. So in other words, the appearance of the second son is that he's a good son. What a wonderful son. He's one of those like Eddie Haskell. Yes, Mrs. Cleaver, you look lovely today. <laughs> That's him. He looks really good, doesn't he? But guess what? Deep down inside, he's rotten to the core. He yeses the old man and then does whatever he wants. He's a hypocrite, in other words. Then Jesus says this. Remember how this parable starts? What do you think? Okay, what do you think, geniuses? Harvard, Princeton, Yale boys? Which of these two did the will of the Father? And they said, the first. Who's the first son? The one who said, I'm not going to go, but he changed his mind and he goes? Why did they say this? Because these people are smart enough to know that Jesus beat him again. Jesus beat him again the second time in how many verses? Right? This carpenter from Nazareth. There's nothing. There's nobody. He's smarter than the geniuses here. Then Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, stop. When the Bible says, truly I, when Jesus says, truly I tell you, what does it mean? It's amen, amen in Aramaic. It means, take out the yellow highlighter and highlight this. This is the point of this parable. Remember the punchline? Every parable is a punchline. Here's the point of the parable. Truly I tell you, pay attention to the words. The tax collectors and prostitutes are going into heaven ahead of you. Now, is that a compliment? <laughs> Jesus, you hurt my little feelings. I have to go get counseling and therapy now. He let him have it with a double barrel shotgun right to the face. What's a tax collector? Let me see. Who's a tax collector that we know? Uh, Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is written by a tax collector. He's the son who said no and then said yes, he repented. A tax collector in the Roman times? Are you kidding me? These are Jews who do the dirty work for the Romans. They collect all the tax money. They're quizzlings and traitors to the Jewish people. The Romans hate them because they're, they use them. They're nothing. They throw away. And the Jews hate them. They're, hate, they're like the most hated person around. And prostitutes. Oh, this is, this is, this is a low occupation. It's kind of like being a shepherd or a fisherman. These are despised occupations. They're considered sinners. Now, do these chief priests and these scribes, do they know about prostitutes? Yeah. The prostitutes probably have a little black book with the names of all the power elite people who work in the temple that come and visit on a regular basis. It must be a spiritual counseling thing, I think. <laughs> Sinners and tax collectors, prostitutes are going to get into the kingdom of God ahead of who? You. Chief priests and scribes. What is this? This is a brutal verbal beatdown. This is a take no prisoners beatdown. This is a humiliating thing. And where did it happen? In front of a couple hundred people in the temple. It happened on their ground, their base of operations. Jesus comes down from Galilee up on the hills and he bests these people in front of this huge crowd of people in their temple. Ooh. But I, I, I missed that point. It was too subtle for me to understand. Okay. Jesus then, the master teacher says, John the Baptist came to you. Chief priest, scribe, you temple people here? He came to you and he said what? Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You are a brood of vipers. 
Is that nasty? Yeah, it's a, like a snake nest. That's what this is, the temple here. It's so corrupt and rotten. John the Baptist told him right to the... And he says this one. You're like a whited sepulcher. What does that mean? In the ancient world, they would bury people. You would put your bones in a sepulcher. What's the big deal? No. In the, in the Jewish world, touching a dead body, dead man's bones, is like the ultimate form of pollution and corruption. Right? I used to... I spent some time down in Long Island. I don't go to Long Island because when they built all the houses in the 1940s in Long Island, they came out from Brooklyn, they didn't have city water and sewer, so they all built like septic tanks. So we're always afraid I'd be standing in somebody's lawn and fall through into the septic tank. It's a worst case scenario. That's what the whited sepulcher is for. You wipe the sepulcher to make sure you don't fall into the tomb and get, come in contact with dead man's bones. John the Baptist calls him that. You're a bunch of whited sepulchers. It's nice and clean and white on the outside with rotten corruption on the inside. Yeah, that's you right there. The temple looks really good, doesn't it? It's a beautiful place, look at that place. But inside, it's rotten, it's a stinking sewer. That's you. John the Baptist came and he identified the problem. You people are rotten. Bunch of vipers, dead man's bones, that's what you do. You use your power, you use your money, you use your position. To build up yourself. Nothing to do with God. This is the house of God. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. Rather than guiding people, rather than leading people, rather than helping people, rather than having the rule of law and having order in the world, you're using the law to enrich yourself and to corrupt everybody. That's what John the Baptist said. He came to you. And he gave you an opportunity, didn't you? What did he say? Repent. Turn your life around. 180 degrees. Turn your life around. Repent. And what happened? You didn't believe him. We don't talk to the hand. We don't, we don't want to hear from you, John the Baptist. Who believed him? The wrong people believed John the Baptist. Tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners flock to John the Baptist. All have, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All are sinners. It's the difference between these religious people, these experts, they don't think they have a problem. People who are sinners know they have a problem. And they want to work on the issue. They want to work on the problem. They want to get right with God and get their life in order. They want to have healing. They want to get the family back together again. Get their nation back together again. That's the difference. They don't want John the Baptist. They didn't believe him. But the sinners and tax collectors, they believed him. Sinners and tax collectors, they're the first son that said no. But when they thought about it, they said yes. Who are we? A church is where sinners come. We come here. We're the ones who said no, maybe early in our life. Maybe even now. But God wants you to say yes now because now is the acceptable time of the Lord. Now's the time to say yes. Now's the time. Now's the time to clean up your act. And what happened? You did not change your mind and you didn't believe him. But these people did. And who are these people? The hundreds of people standing around Jesus in the temple. They believe God and is counted unto them as righteousness. What do we do today? What do we do about this story? This is a powerful, powerful story. For the people that have it made, they don't want a savior. But for us, these are the words of eternal life. This is the power of eternal life. The forgiveness of God, the love of God. The opportunity to turn the page on your old, old way and start life all fresh again. Faith in Christ, that's what does it. That's why he came to this world. That's why he went to Jerusalem. That's why he's there in that temple. That's why he's betrayed and dies on the cross for our sins. Because he loves you and he understands you. That's the message of Christ.
I better end there. Amen. Amen. Will the congregation please turn to our hymn of the day, hymn number 40 in the Blue Hymn Book. Alexa, 
Catherine, my mother Linda, Frank, Christina, Mark, Ted, Eric, Heidi, Lida, Callie and Tom, Faith and Jen, all students and teachers returning to school this fall, and all those who name out loud are in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. Holy God, by your power, grant this congregation, St. Paul's Luther Church of Wurttemberg, the faith to stand firm in Christ Jesus. Strengthen your spirit to this place, in this place, so that through all of its ministries, your wisdom and truth might be made known. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. God of blessed hope, Comfort those who grieve with the promise of new life in Christ Jesus. Give us the blessed assurance that you will swallow up in death forever. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. in your hands, holy God, we commend all for whom we pray. Trust in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I know at this point, the reason you come to church is to honk the horn. <laughs> so we really need to get some of those horns, you know, that like bicycle horns or bells that we can ring during this time. So the peace of Christ be with you always. You can look, but you can't touch. Share the peace of Christ with one another. There you go. <laughs> In the night in which he was betrayed, 
Our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after power, uh, and again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the remission of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. and by station, so follow Robert's lead.
Barnes and Jonah singing our post community cantal, Thank the Lord.